communication, I think it's very well known. And so this is why I think it would be useful for us to explore it today, specifically in terms of primary English language teaching. Now, the children's literature formats that I'm going to be focusing on in today's session include picture books, and my example is Welcome, as you can see there by Baru, um, illustrated chapter books or chapter novels, and we have their Planet Omar Accidental Trouble Magnet by Zain of Nian. And then we have a verse novel. And my example today of the verse novel is Home of the Brave by Catherine Applegate. So those are my examples that we'll be exploring a little bit later. So in true primary ELT fashion then, I'd like to share with you now my menu for the webinar. So here goes. First of all, I want us really to identify what this metaphor is referring to. And basically it's about representation, representing children's identities in the plural and specifically their intersectional identity. So we're going to make that concrete. We're gonna explore it. And I want you to be clear on what I mean by intersectional identities at primary school, first of all. After that, I want us to look at representation in primary English language teaching course books. Now, you might think that's a little bit unusual coming to a webinar on literature, but in my experience in primary English language teacher education around the world, I often find teachers don't use too much or very much children's literature in their primary English language lessons. So I want to start with what many teachers around the world, I'm sure many of you who are here today use, um, which are course books. And I want us to look at those intersectional identities in terms of primary English course books. And then look at potentially the shortcomings of representation in course books and how literature can help us as primary English language teachers and teacher educators disrupt the lack of representation. And then I want us to really apply the metaphor, the mirrors, the windows, and the sliding glass doors to primary ELT. And then finally, and very importantly, I want to share some concrete and practical teaching ideas that you can try not only with these three examples of children's literature formats, but with many other um, picture books and um, illustrated chapter novels and verse novels. And I want us to think about these teaching ideas today in terms of standing with the characters. Another way of saying that would be of helping children empathize with the characters, recognize the characters and their intersectional identity. So coming right back to the beginning. Okay, so this idea then, what do I mean when I say intersectional identities? I'm going to share a quote here from Kustasha at the University of Edinburgh. And in her research, she was looking at children's identities at primary school. And this is what she said. She talked about um, gender and ethnicity, age, sexuality, interpersonal relationships, et cetera. And I'm sure you, in your experience of working with children, um, can think of many other aspects of identities. And she says how they all play a part. They all play a part in a child's sense of identity, in what makes up the child's identity. And all of these aspects come together. And, and it's not just for children, is it? It's for all of us. All of us have many different aspects of our identities that make us who we are. But she goes on to say, and this is uh, very important in terms of representation, how different aspects of these identities may be foregrounded or given visibility and prominence, or they may be silenced. And some intersections, so some combinations, if you like, of gender and age and sexuality and um, ethnicity are um, given prominence and the children feel a sense of belonging or they feel a sense of being excluded. And 
this might sound a little bit complicated because it is complex. Aspects of identity are complex and I don't want to pretend otherwise because when in her research, what Kustasha found was in the classroom situation, sometimes certain identities were valued um, by other children at, at certain times and not at other times, depending on the situation and the identities of the various children who were interacting with each other. So it's complex, this idea of identity. And um, it really relates to feeling part of the classroom community, of the school community, or not feeling part. And I'm sure you can all think of children that you've worked with, that you've taught, um, or teachers that you've worked with who feel um, part of the community, our educational community, or not part of the community linked to aspects of identity. Okay, so let's um, take an image then. So we're talking about children's literature, lots of children's literature formats use images to make this concrete. And this um, uh, is a power, uh, for me, a very powerful illustration by Henry James Garrett, um, who produced this in the context of the rise in transphobic um, hate on social media. So here we have the butterfly saying, hello, I'm a butterfly. And in response, hello, caterpillar, you are a caterpillar. Now, we could replace this. I mean, this is about transphobia, but we could replace this with many different aspects of identity, such as gender, such as ethnicity, such as disability, many different reverse aspects of identity where a person, a child in our case, is saying what, how they wish to be seen and represented. And another child, often from a dominant group, is saying, no, that's not who you are. That's not actually part of you. And uh, just think about that for a moment, the profound effect it can have when in education, and in language education, aspects of identity are not recognized and not prized and actually are hidden and silenced. So that's very much what we are focusing on when we talk about identities today. So moving on then, I want to make this relevant to you, to your work and to your world in primary English language education. And I want to start, as I said at the beginning, looking at course books. So in March 2019, I conducted a small survey among the primary ELT publishing world. And this is one of the questions I asked. Now, who is part of that world? Well, we had authors. We had um, so course book authors. We had editors of course books. We had project managers. We had representatives from publishing houses. So all of the different kinds of roles within ELT, primary ELT publishing. And one of the questions I asked them was which aspects of children's identities are often not represented in primary ELT course books. So just have a think about that. I mean, you might want to type your ideas based on your experiences of primary English language course books, which aspects of identities are often not represented. And I'm going to share their responses as photographs with you. And as I share each one of the photographs, just type in the chat box what aspect of identity you think that might represent. And I'll share with you actually what aspects are represented by those images. Okay, so number one, which aspects of children's identities does each photo represent? And number two, personalize this to you. Are these identities represented in your primary ELT course books? So think of the course book you currently use or have used in the past um, or, or several books. And just think about each picture. I'm going to start with the girl with her arms out like this and her legs. And I'm going to talk you through this primary ELT publishing community, these are the aspects of identity that they said are very rarely included in primary English language course books for the international market. So 
first of all, then you can type your ideas. I'm sure you have many ideas, um, but I'm gonna start with the girl here with her arms up. So this aspect of identity is actually to do with um, physical appearance. And this girl um, is showing her arms and she's showing her legs, as you can see. So in horse books for the international market, these are often covered up, okay? So we don't see the arms and legs. All right, next one then. As you can see, you've got the two men and the, the, the child on the shoulders, so the two dads. Don't often see those in horse books. Another elephant there. The little boy then um, eating, eating that. Um, so this is uh, a representation of uh, religion, um, an overt, visible symbol of religion. Don't often see those. Then the next one um, with the dog. What do you think? Okay, so this one then is a dog inside the home out. Then we have the boy on his laptop. What do you think for that one? This one's to do again with physical appearance. This is to do with the child being overweight. Not a good idea for ELT course books. Out he goes. How about the little girl underneath? So um, this, this little girl has Down syndrome don't often see children with Down syndrome in ELT course books. Next one, little girl wearing hijab. Don't often see um, girls in hijab in the course books. This boy, what's he eating? Pork sausage, out he goes as well. The next one, perhaps a little bit more challenging to identify. This is a celebration. So this is having a party. Out it goes as well. And then the next one, the three children together then. So the thing to know about these three children is they are not related. So they're not relatives. So you have boys and girls together but, and they are in close physical contact and they are not related. So they go out as well. And the final one, which I think is quite challenging to guess which aspect that might be, be the boy holding the globe. This is to do with different countries where there are disputes over the borders. So the borders between countries are disputed, not often present in ELT course books. So I've covered all of these with elephants based on that expression, the elephant in the room. And I want us to think about, you know, the elephant in the primary English language classroom and the elephants in the primary English language course book, because basically what we're doing here, well, not we, but what the, the primary English language teaching publishing world is doing here is they are hiding and they are silencing all of these aspects of children's identities. Yet, as you know, as we know, as primary English language teachers, the various complex intersections and combinations of all of these identities and many, many others that I'm sure you can think of based on the children you've worked with and the children you know are rendered invisible. So what we're having then in ELT course books is obviously an unrealistic representation of the world. Now, before I move on to literature, I want to say a few things about this situation. Because what we see more and more at conferences and in blog posts and in webinars and so on and articles are ELT materials writers talking about this, this, the lack of representation in published materials and talking about strict briefs from publishers that they must comply with and they must follow and also not having much freedom then and having to write for such an international market that suits everyone. Now, I'd actually respond by saying, well, in fact, you end up not really suiting anyone. However, I think that um, that's only part of the picture here. 
when the concerns are raised about the ELT, the commercial ELT publishing world and course books, I think all of those are valid concerns. But I think it um, takes away attention from some other very important areas that, in my opinion, we need to start talking much more about. The first one is this idea in primary English language teaching of the need to simplify. So think about language. So when we are teaching English and we're selecting which language, which grammar, which vocabulary, which functional language to share or teach and focus on with children, we need to select according to their English levels, according to their ages and so on. And then when we are thinking about the content, we need to select content that's relevant to their um, stage, their life stage, their conceptual development and, and all those other aspects. Again, highly valid. However, what we cannot do with um, intersectional identities is we cannot simplify them because otherwise we're taking away fundamental aspects of who children are and who people are. So I understand the need, of course, in primary English language teaching to select appropriate language for the child's level and appropriate content. However, when it comes to intersectional identities, we, we can't take those things away and we can't simplify reality and the reality of the children in our classrooms it's not about simplifying, it's about finding ways, and to use Carol Reed's expression, ways of reaching and teaching our learners um, with all of their complex intersections and not just teaching them about those, but recognizing and affirming those. There's another aspect as well that doesn't really get much attention and doesn't get talked about but it's also to do with dominant voices. It's to do with dominant voices in the primary ELT author, course book author community. And the fact that there isn't a lot of diverse intersectional representation, in my view, among that community. And so when people are, what we can say, within the margins, rather, the, rather than on the outside of the margins, such as the children represented in these photographs, they, in my view, are not sufficiently, as a community of, of authors, prioritizing the need to represent diverse intersectional identities. Now, I appreciate that there will be people who disagree with that. However, there's a lot of focus on the publishing houses and what they need to do. But I also think there needs to be a lot more focus on what individual authors who are prominent and dominant in primary ELT course book authoring also need to be doing to raise the profile of intersectional identities. Okay. I also would like to suggest today though, that as English language teachers for primary and primary English language teacher educators, we cannot wait we cannot wait for the publishing houses to get their houses in order when it comes to representation. We cannot wait for authors. We need to um, have the agency and empower ourselves to take action when it comes to including and representing children's intersectional identities. And this is where literature can make all the difference because if we are not seeing and we're not representing and we're not including diverse children's identities in our course book material, this is where we can bring in literature in order to disrupt the situation in primary ELT and ensure that um, intersectional identities are represented in our English lessons. And then the children in our classrooms are also affirmed for whatever their diverse intersections might be. B. So um, I really like this quote from Ahmad and Nasi Combs, who talk about how literature that authentically reflects. Now they talk about cultural diversity. We could change the word cultural to gender, ethnicity, um, uh, nationality, whatever aspect of diversity. But if it's authentic, if it's an authentic reflection, then it can help children as readers, as young readers, potentially 
And I want to say potentially because it depends on many factors, but potentially become more flexible in their perspective towards difference, towards difference and potentially embracing of difference. And then they go on to say this is in contrast to the representation in um, uh, ELT course books for school. So I, so what I'm basically my main message today then is literature can make a difference. Depends on many factors, but it has the potential to disrupt this situation and teachers then have the agency to bring in literature into their lessons for children and bring in and give visibility and voice to these intersectional identities. Okay, so that nicely brings us to our metaphor for today, which is mirrors, windows, and sliding glass doors. And as I said at the very, very beginning, this was first um, conceived in 1990 by Rudin Sims Bishop, and she was interviewed about it in 2015. So as you listen to this, it's very, very short. I just want you to note either, you know, on a piece of paper or in your mind, um, what are mirrors then when it comes to books, when it comes to literature? What are windows and what are sliding glass doors? So what does the metaphor mean in terms of literature? We need diverse books because we need books in which children can find themselves, see reflections of themselves. I wrote a piece, uh, maybe in 1990 it was published, uh, which I called Mirrors, Windows, and Sliding Glass Doors. Uh, and, and I think that's, that's really why we, we um, children need to see themselves reflected, but books can also be windows. Um, and, and so you can, you can look through uh, and see other worlds and see how they match up or don't match up to your own. But the sliding glass door allows you to enter that world as well. And so that's the reason that, that the diversity needs to go both ways. I mean, it's not just children uh, who have been underrepresented and marginalized who need these books. It's also the children uh, who always find their mirrors in the books and therefore get an exaggerated sense of their own self-worth and a false sense of what the world is like because it's, it's uh, becoming more and more colorful <laughs> and diverse uh, as, as time goes on. Um, so I think that's why. Okay. Okay, so what she's saying there is we need books in which children can see reflections of themselves, so the mirror idea, but also look through and see other worlds, the window idea. So thinking about affirming their own identities, but also seeing different identities as well. And books are a powerful vehicle in order to help us do this in English language teaching. So let's just unpack that metaphor then. So the mirrors giving children a reflection of their own lives and their own lived experiences. And if you think about the diverse range of books, and it's really exciting now because we're getting so many aspects of identity represented in children's literature. So we can really ensure that children can connect to and recognize aspects of themselves. And I, I really want to emphasize that aspects point because it isn't because we bring in a book featuring a child with a certain ethnicity or religion or gender and so on, that that is going to mean that child automatically identifies with that aspect of identity because there are many ways to, to be. So there's many ways to be a particular religion to be a particular gender, to be a particular ethnicity and so on. So it, that's what I said at the very beginning when it's complex. So it, variety then I think is the important message here that it's varied windows and mirrors, not just the thinking that this equals the way to be, this character is 
like this child in my classroom. It, it's more complex than that. And then windows offer children views of worlds that may be real, potentially, but they may be imagined as well. So the potential of the imagination, and I don't think we should forget that. Um, they may be familiar to some children in, in our classrooms. They may be unfamiliar. And then the powerful part of the metaphor, kind of bringing the mirrors and the windows together, is these imaginary doorways that in the imaginations the child can walk through. And really what we're saying here is empathize. So trying to help children develop empathy with difference. Short, whose work I really like. And she talks about how we, the mirror and the window actually function together. So children, when they encounter characters in children's literature, they look back on through personalization. If we do certain personalization tasks and activities, they can look back on their own lives, their own ways of being, their own ways of living, their own cultures in potentially a different light. And this is what we mean when we talk about maybe helping them change perspective about difference. Okay. So I just want to look a little bit more about the idea of the sliding glass door. So when, if our goal then is empathy, we want children to empathize with the characters in children's literature and respond in an empathetic way to, to their, their lives. We need to consider how we use books as windows. So for example, Tasha and I, I don't know how many of you are at Tasha and Gail's great webinar on Monday, but Tasha and I were talking yesterday about um, refugees and refugee literature, which is now becoming bigger and bigger and bigger in children's literature, which is great. But we're talking about if you are a child or a student teacher or a teacher who has never had that experience, having children identify or thinking that a book will help a child identify with the refugee experience isn't a realistic goal. And it's rather, our goal should be that we want to bring in those experiences, those characters' experience through literature to help children empathize with that experience rather than identify with. And there is a difference. Um, and this is from Jenna Heberger Conti, who talks about what we actually are trying to do. We don't just want children to look through and think, oh, isn't that world very unusual or interesting or strange or fantastic? But we actually want them to really, what she calls, stand with the characters and, and understand their situations, their challenges, but also their joys and their, their experience as well. So it's a deepening of understanding and again, empathy. Because if windows, and this is from Michelle Mepique, who talks about if windows kind of become different, you're bringing in these books and difference becomes an object of curiosity, can actually be an obstacle to empathy and reinforce exactly what we don't want, which is othering. And also essentializing where this idea that one aspect shown in the literature of, of a particular group is referred to the whole group. So all um, members of that group are like that, which is not actually the case, it's very inaccurate and that's essentializing. Okay, and so what Hebrew Conti says we need to do in our classrooms, in English language teaching is create spaces for sliding door moments where children have a sense of agency leading to potentially social justice action taking. So where there's an, an, a response to the children's literature that is so powerful and meaningful that children want to do something around that topic. So if it's a refugee story and you're using it in English language teaching, what could that catalyst be? What could that inspire then? Now, um, children's literature scholars often say, but you know, it's not the book that does the action. Literature can't do actions. It's what you do with the literature and what, how the children engage with it, respond to it, that leads to the action taking. And I thought, yes, how very true. And then I discovered, which are just amazing, 
from Wilso, and you might want to have a look at this. These are books. There's one about a carrot, there's one about um, the dill, and there's another one about the parsley. And these books, the paper from the back page, the children can actually plant it and it grows the carrots and it grows the parsley and it grows the dill. And I thought, well, the books perhaps can take action after all, <laughs> but usually they can't. It's, it's the children, it's the, it's the school, it's the education system that needs to be taking the action. All right, how? And, and this is a re the really important part for us uh, in terms of classroom practice. And it depends on the strategies we use in the classroom, obviously, how we scaffold. And really importantly for me, this is the creative bit, the tasks and the activities we do. And if you want an umbrella term for the strategies, the techniques and the tasks, I use the term mediation. And this comes from the idea of, to use Janice Bland's term, deep reading. So it's not about comprehension questions, it's not about true, false, it's not about right, wrong, it's not about yes, no. It's going much, much deeper than that, that the activities children do and the tasks they do around literature engage them in a meaningful way so that they really explore, if you like, and I've used the term delve into, go deep into the realities of those characters, the feelings of the characters and the perspectives of the characters. So we're not just wanting comprehension of the plot. We're actually, if we're going to ignite empathy, we want to go deep. So let's make this concrete now. And as I said, I'm going to use picture book and my chosen picture book for today is Welcome, which is one of my favorite, currently favorites. All right. So some of you might have used Welcome. You might know what happens. Um, it's why I think this is such a great picture book is that it really combines two very current themes. It's the climate crisis and also the refugee crisis coming together. And this is forced migration due to um, climate change. And it's a really accessible for lower primary. So in my context, which is Norway, with my student teachers, we use this with around grade three, four. And in your context, you potentially use it with a little bit younger, a little bit older, but it's very accessible due to the, the characters. The characters are all animals, polar bears and various other ones. Um, and the story then, if you look at the publisher's website, the story does link to the Syrian refugee crisis. Um, so it has the, these real world links in accessible ways for children. Um, what happens, just to give you a quick synopsis, the polar, so the three polar bears, and due to climate change, you know, the icebergs are melting and so on, they have to leave and they have to, you know, go into the deep ocean and they're trying to find safety, they're trying to find land, and they're turned away three times with very, very weak excuses. So you can really see the parallels then to the refugee crisis and what, what happened in Europe. And then eventually they find an uninhabited island and they make it their home. And at the end of the story, which is very, very heartwarming, some monkeys arrive who are also affected by climate change. And the kind of the crux is, will they welcome the monkeys then? And you'll be pleased to hear they do. And it's told in the first person narrative from the perspective of the main character. So that's very immediate and very direct language wise, which is for me, the first trigger to empathy. So what can we do with this book if we want to combine mirrors, windows, and most importantly for me, the sliding glass doors and opportunities for standing with those characters. So help the children in our English language lessons stand with. And here are some ideas. Okay, so the back cover, I don't know if you can see that the front cover and the back cover give such important clues to the habitats. And the fact that this is desert-like and sand-like on a um, Caribbean island um, 
and then thinking about using photographs of the original habitats of the polar bears and the monkeys and then having the children predict then why these covers are different. So immediately we're triggering, we're, we're linking to, in a very visual way, these experiences and getting the children predict, predicting before we've even opened the picture book. And then modeling this language for children to make their predictions. Perhaps, maybe, I think, I suppose. What's great about this book is the way the, the spreads or the openings really bleed across the page. So it really helps the children feel part of the, the story and feel. And, and again, the, these visuals can help the children empathize. Well, how would you feel in this situation? And, and again, the use of fonts is significant and draws their attention. Um, at one point, the polar bears play games. This says, so we play games to pass the time. I spy with my little eye, something beginning with W. What better gift for primary English language teachers is this? <laughs> Immediately you're into vocabulary games. But what I'm saying is the children then become part of this. They're joining in with those characters to help empathize. Now, as I said, there are three what I call pivotal moments or turning points where the polar bears are rejected. And the excuses are flimsy, they're weak excuses. You are dot, 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 you are to this, you are to that. And again, that is a real chance in the English language classroom for children to role play you are dialogues with these excuses to again, foster empathy. And the children then could creatively in groups create an fourth scenario using the you are excuses. Of course, we want to disrupt that and we want to creatively design um, opportunities where the, the, they empathize with what it feels like to be welcome, not just to feel unwelcome. And my idea here is that the children design welcome mats for their school. So taking it beyond the book, to the scenario of a new child joining our class, joining our English class, and we want to welcome them with a nice big welcome mat, would be on big paper and have the children have um, messages in English for that child and also illustrate it. And I think to really help the children empathize, it would be wonderful. This is the final spread where the polar bears and the monkeys they welcome the monkeys and they're, they're having a celebration there. Um, and it would be great if the children, if there is a refugee center in your town or in your city, if the children could visit that center and potentially recreate this spread as a kind of a rockery, a garden um, with the, the members of that center. So very ambitious um, for English language teaching, but I think really trying to take the themes beyond the classroom and beyond the book really brings it into the real world. And the book acts as a vehicle for this age accessibility. Okay, so my next one then for upper primary, this is my illustrated chapter book, um, not mine, <laughs> Zane of Mians, <laughs> illustrated by Nasaya Matharidik. And as you can see from the title, Omar is very accident prone and gets into all kinds of trouble. So it's very humorous. So you can immediately see the appeal for upper primary then. And it's a story about a family who moved to a new part of the country. It's set in the UK. And essentially the themes are, in terms of intersectional uh, identities, religious diversity. And it makes the the themes accessible to um, this age range. So around children age around 10 to 12, I would say. And it's told again, like the, the, this one is told from the perspective of the main character, the polar bear. This one is told from the perspective of the main character, Omar and his many mishaps. But it also deals with very serious uh, issues such as bullying in school and also Islamophobia. They're, the family have a, a neighbor who is Islamophobic 
and that is presented in a way that's accessible to this age range. It does end with an uplifting message um, of learning about each other's um, religious celebrations actually and becoming a good neighbor. So I don't have this one with me actually. And so this is why I've included a page here, just so you can see. As it's an illustrated chapter book, these illustrations are so child friendly for this age range and immediately present opportunities, in my view, for that standing with. It, it's got such great potential um, and, and acts as a real scaffold for meaning. Okay, so what can we do with this one? Well, I'm borrowing and I'm adapting ideas from my colleague at Nord University, so Rashi Rohatgi, and her piece, you can um, freely download this, it's open access from the Keeley Journal. And these are some of her ideas. So again, starting with those predictions, and there's an audio version of this book, which is a great way in for children of this age to really start brainstorming in groups based on a little clip, and then really working with those illustrations. So the children making illustrations based on the predictions and then comparing with Omar's drawings. So immediately an opportunity for standing with, and then using drawings to reflect on the surprises that happen in the book, for example, um, there's a bully, as I said, Daniel, and it deals a lot with uh, Islamophobia, this book, and Omar's mom wears hijab, and Daniel draws a picture of her as a witch, and then Omar draws a picture saying, no, not a witch, and it's a real opportunity for the children to empathize with that kind of bullying um, based on religion at school, and then they can role play the, between Omar and Daniel, the bully, based on the dialogue, the, the verbal text in the book. And again, moving from those moments of tension then into deeper understanding, arts and crafts, making mini books of kindness, how can we be a good neighbor, but also researching different religious celebrations. They might be in the children's class, so different religions present in the primary English class, but beyond the class, linked to the book really like the cultural x-rays idea which is where you have an outline of the character and then you know the children decide where you know in his head hands heart feet wherever fingers different aspects of omar's identity based on their intersectional identities based on their interpretations and then of course they do them for themselves so this is a way of bringing in the children's identities in english and then exchanging with in pairs and in mini groups. And just like we said for um, welcome, having the children create the rockery, we also have with Planet Omar the idea of helping neighbors in the community, because it, as I said, they have an Islamic phobic neighbor and she actually becomes ill. And then the family take her to hospital, they cook for her, and um, she becomes like a member of the family, and, and those barriers are broken down. So the action-taking element here would be thinking about concrete and practical ways that the children could help, especially elderly neighbours in the community. Okay, and then this one also for upper primary, I'm not sure how many of you have used verse novels, but verse novels are great because they are great for English language teaching because each um, verse is an episode. So you can deal with them in short bites and they fit very nicely into English lessons and they can be really well sequenced and children can read parts of poem as well at this age in upper primary. This is one of my favorites, my current favorites, Home of the Brave by Catherine Applegate, and, and, and it's a refugee story, um, and it's accessible to upper primary English learners. It's very um, poetic language, but in, it's short. So each verse is very, very short. I don't know if you can see there, but you know, they're, they're in four lines, each of them. So very bite-sized, great for language teaching. Loads of humor, just like Omar, and lots of humanity because this is this links to um, the just before the creation of South Sudan, and um, 
So there's a lot of um, untold horrors actually behind this book, but they're made, the, the situation is made accessible to children through humor. From the perspective again, just like Welcome, just like Planet Omar of the main character Keck. And there you can see Keck with Gol the cow, um, who he looks after in, in his new home of Minnesota in the US. And it's really a story of perseverance and strength as Keck comes to terms with and starts to understand his new home. And what is so colorful, great for language exploration as well, is that the, the foreignness of the US is expressed using images from Sudan. So that's a real great bridge. And for more proficient classes with strong English, you can imagine the creativity you can have there. So here are my home of the brave ideas. So the pivotal moments here, well, the pivotal moments for, for the upper primary will very much depend on what the children think are the pivotal moments. And it's great for them to draw Keck, illustrate the pivotal moment, because in, in a verse novel, there's no illustrations. So that's a great opportunity for the children to interpret themselves. And then they can do thought clouds with what are Keck's inner thoughts. Great for language stretching, as I said, loads of metaphors in, in Home of the Brave based on Sudan. So the children can become metaphor detectives. They can comb the text for metaphors and then illustrate these. Now, many English language teachers like a gap fill, <laughs> but this is not a traditional gap fill. This is, what are the gaps? Because verse novels, there's a lot of um, aspects of the story that we don't see in the book but the children can use their imaginations to create some of the gaps, some of the scenes that we don't see in the book. We also like timelines, don't we, in past, present, future in English language teaching. But this is a timeline with a difference. This is where the children create a timeline about Keck and his relationship with Gold the Cow um, and how this links to Keck's past. Keck's present and potentially Keck's future. Um, many humorous moments in this book, such as when Keck is learning to use new appliances. This is a great creative scaffold for children then to design their own new appliance and then role play explaining how to use it to another child, to a partner. They could choose one of the verses from Keck's perspective and then have a socials chat, like a social media chat could be done easily with post-it notes even um, to another child, maybe a child back home or a child in another city in their imaginations. The journey map then. So Keck's long journey from Sudan to Minnesota and, and then visually representing what might have happened on that journey and then presenting their maps in English in groups. Then, well, at the very end, I, I will give the game away. Sorry. <laughs> at the very end, Keck's mum arrives, actually. So it has a very, very happy ending because throughout he's, he doesn't know where his mum, what's happened to mum, and she arrives in Minnesota at the end. And this is, you know, alternative endings. Well, this is an extension. What happens next when mum arrives in Minnesota? Great for creative writing for your higher levels as well. Then, very importantly, just to mention, Catherine Applegate, we said that the difference between identifying with characters and empathizing with characters. Catherine Applegate has not got that first-hand experience of the refugee experience. And that isn't only one experience anyway, it's obviously multiple and different. And so this is important for the children, particularly your, you know, your 11, 12 year olds to do a little bit of mini research on what actually happened. And, and Keck's story is actually a fictional representation based on the lost boys of Sudan. But also of course, we've got the lost girls of um, Sudan whose story we hear much less of. So there's real opportunities there. And then of course, just like, just like Welcome, just like Anna Omar, we have those opportunities for taking action, which is welcoming 
what can we do? What can the class do? What can the children do in a concrete, practical sense to welcome um, not only refugee children, but any newcomer children into their school and community? So real opportunities for standing with. So what are my key messages then based on this whirlwind tour through these uh, three formats? Well, first of all, then, um, based on our reflections on primary English language teaching course books, intersectional identities are often hidden there and their voices of children with different identities are often silenced. Using literature such as picture books, such as illustrated chapter books, such as verse novels, gives us an opportunity for, as English language teachers and teacher educators, for us to take the initiative to disrupt. We don't have to wait for the publishing houses to sort themselves out. That may never happen. We can do that. We have that agency. Um, thinking about mirrors and windows in the sense of when the children are exploring a character's experience in these um, books, they then use that experience to then reflect on themselves and their own lives through personalization. So it's a two way um, reflection process rather than othering or essentializing. Um, enabling learners to open those sliding glass doors then so to empathize with the characters in books, to really go deep into their feelings, into their experiences, into their emotions, and do that through creative tasks, through mediating, so our scaffolding, our techniques, and our tasks and activities to ultimately, and hopefully, because we can never be sure, but hopefully inspire the children to want to, through their English lessons, take action to ideally make the world a better place. Thank you very much. Those are my references. Fantastic. Thank you, David. I almost forgot to come back in then. <laughs> I think I was sort of engaged in listening and watching. Um, That's fantastic. Thank you. Really, really, really enjoyed that. Um, and as you said, you know, as part of this, this series this week, it's, uh, it's a fantastic um, webinar and, and obviously Tasha and Gail's webinar on Monday. Yeah, if anyone missed that, then the recording is available. Um, and, and this um, sort of builds on that and, and really fascinating and, and it's interesting. I've learned a huge amount. So thank you, David. Really, 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 really great. And lots of. You're, you're very welcome. And Laura, with her focus on graphic novels, I'm really looking forward to that because that's a whole other um, yes. format. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. No, no, exactly. So I think, um, yeah, it's gonna be great. Um, I also want to say thank you to people on Facebook for watching um, and commenting. I know there's been lots and lots of comments there. Um, and had hundreds of people watching on Facebook. Um, and so thank you to That's Marcus great. and to Karen for moderating that um, and running that. They ran a poll actually, which was interesting. And we will we will get to, to questions in just a minute. But um, one of the interesting things on, on, on Facebook, um, Marcus and Karen ran a poll, uh, which was, do, do, your, do your learners feel represented in the stories they read? Okay. Um, and the results of the poll were, was either, you can either choose yes, no, or a little. Um, and it's interesting, 50, over 50% said yes. Um, only 17% said no, which kind of made me think, and it's a question, I guess, for you, when we wonder, oh, oh, <laughs> In terms of teachers and how well we know our students, how, how well do we know them well enough to be able to answer that question accurately? Um, and if we don't, what kind of things do we need to do as teachers, do you think, to, to kind of get to know our students better so that when we do present them with, with the literature that you've been talking about, we're, we're confident that that is, is kind of representing them and their identity? <laughs> do I have comment on that? <laughs> yes, I think also something that I haven't mentioned because my focus was very much on identities, but also the children's interests, of course, are going to be so different in our classes. And I think that's why, you know, we can't just use one picture book or one verse novel or one graphic novel or anything. We have to really try and bring in a variety so we can do that reaching and teaching. 
but I, I totally agree, Paul, that knowing the learners as people is so important, um, not only knowing their English strengths and weaknesses, their language, but also them as people. And I think potentially, I mean, it will very much depend on context, but I think those teachers working in mainstream education have a much um, easier or better or more access opportunity for getting to really know those children very well. And those in the out of school sector, maybe seeing them once a week could take a lot longer. Um, but I think it's really important from our first lesson that we're constantly trying to personalize and really get their voices going and their views in, in, in multimodal ways and child-friendly ways. So we really are showing them, we're listening to them, we're interested in them, but also, you know, we're interested in them as, as complex people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not just yes. as language learners. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, thank you. Okay. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, Okay, uh, right, questions, we've got quite a few. We're not going to be able to get through them all, but let's just try and get through some of them. Um, there was an interesting one that I saw from, uh, from Tasha, Tasha Mitchell. Um, deep reading that you spoke about, and she says, I can understand how this would work with native speakers um, of the language or very high level learners, but how effectively would it work with very low level primary so that wasn't actually the question I was looking for there's another one which is slightly more but they're both interesting questions but let's let's focus on that one <laughs> so with low well, level problems, think, there's a few people have asked about that I think with low levels this is where we can use our multimodal text such as picture books where we're working like Gail and Tasha explored on Monday we're working with the verbal text but also the visual text and really involving children in reading images and responding to images because the image is so immediate and so powerful and so if we get children used to exploring picture books in it, in our english lessons and the paratextual features the the covers the end papers the dedication the title pages but also systematically encouraging them to respond how would you feel what might you do and 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 ultimately as well, depending on the situation, if the teacher has the children's language, bringing in their languages as well. But I think the visual is so powerful in the picture book and for older children, uh, the, the illustrated chapter book, that it, it helps unlock. But I, I think we can use, um, especially the picture books with the, with the youngest of English learners. Mm -hmm. okay but it's it's that mediation thing so it's how do we scaffold and um and 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 using the children's languages where necessary but really drawing on the images mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. as keys to meaning mm -hmm. okay okay Thanks. and having the children respond in images as well through the drawings mm -hmm. through their their arts and crafts work and all of that so not so it's not totally language dependent but also providing that language support, feeding it in, modeling it, demonstrating it um, is, is really important as well, I think. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, I will come back to Tasha's other question. I know Sandy, you just put it in the chat there, so I will come back to it. Um, before I do, a question from Michael, Michael Keating. Um, are there any techniques to approach certain issues which may be culturally taboo? Um, and he's thinking in particular about the views of the parents, because um, obviously there's that, that, that whole kind of context there that needs to be kind of dealt with sensitively and approached sensitively. So I just wondered if it's my- I think yeah. um, parents are key and having the parents understanding the methodology, understanding you know, why you are using certain books in English lessons, um, having that communication, that dialogue with parents. And I'd go as far as to say parent training so where you're inviting the parents in or you're sending a little recording home um, so they are understanding and they're more methodologically prepared. Um, I, I think sharing rationales, we often talk about sharing our rationales with our learners in age accessible and language accessible ways. But I also think we need to share our rationales with parents uh, in ways that, you know, we're not talking to English teachers here. So, you know, that doesn't overload with, with 
ELT terminology, but that they do understand the rationales why. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's not easy that, and but I do think bringing in the parents, you know, as Gail Ellis has talked about before, parents as partners is key. Um, and ultimately, when it comes to taboo topics in different contexts, I would say it's so important to validate children in, in their complex intersectional identities. But ultimately, we should never risk anyone's safety, including ourselves as the teacher. So I think we need to be aware of that element in a context. So if we're going to have, and we've seen it around the world, we've seen it in the UK, if we're going to, you know, if a topic or a book is going to evoke reaction, I'm not saying don't touch it, but make preparations, consult with, the, with colleagues, with, with academic managers, with parents and so on. Um, so it needs more planning, okay. I would say. Okay. okay. Interestingly, to sort of following on from that uh, question from Mohammed Al um, should the students share in choosing the book or the story, or is it is it the teacher's responsibility? Just oh, definitely, they should share hundred percent, and and that's the thing. I mean, I, I've chosen some of my favourites today, um, but you, you know, when I work with my student teachers at the university, who are primary English teachers in Norway, they. My, I see part of my role in teacher ed as exposing them to many different formats, genres, topics, uh, themes. And then when they do presentations and, and also they do their written assignments and their creative assignments, they choose the formats. And so similarly with children, there should be a choice. Um, because if we want them to invest in terms of empathy and response, they, they need to have some input while also, and this is where we become this very juggling act, isn't it, of meeting our curriculum aims <laughs> and our language syllabus, um, including our wider educational goals, but also trying wherever possible to get the children's input, their voices into book choices, definitely. Okay, great, thank you. Um, okay, so, uh, question, 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 there it is. <laughs> so I'm just scrolling down through them all. Uh, okay, um, so this is the other question I was going to ask from Tasha. Uh, so it's love's idea of standing with characters and everything that you've discussed today, but is there ever a concern that engaging with stories that deal with aspects of their identity could be triggers for children who may have experienced a lot of trauma, for example, in relation to that aspect of their identity? Um, for example, reaction of a child who's been badly bullied or hurt by Islamophobics um, and concerned about sort of creating situations that we're not trained to deal with as teachers. I think that's really important point and very valid. Um, and I think if I can use my own context, because that really helps make it concrete. So in Norway, um, we do have in our primary schools uh, more and more children who, who have experienced being refugees. And so we do use a lot of refugee stories because there's more and more being created and they are powerful stories such as Welcome, which I love. But when we shared these in our in-service teacher programs, they did say that they had concerns and their principals had concerns about using um, refugee stories when there were refugee children in the class. So I think, Paul, it goes back to the, the first comment and question around um, knowing the children, knowing their, them as people and knowing their experiences and selecting judiciously. So again, it's not a don't use it, you can't, but it's make principal decisions for book choices based on those children in the class. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, we sort of run out of time. There's just one thing I wanted to touch on, um, and it's more around. There's been a lot, of, lot of, quite a few questions and comments about being able to download the books for free or, or get the, the material for free. Um, now, my sort of feeling about it is around copyright. It's around intellectual property. It's around the work of the author and the illustrator that's gone into producing that work and that book. Um, and the fact that if there is a way to download these books for free, then obviously that's taking away income from the hard work that those authors and illustrators and everyone involved 
um, has has um, has kind of done. So, I mean, I think my suggestion is, if you do work in a school or you work in a in a district, um, then obviously the the best way to get the books rather than having to try and buy them yourself is to um, approach the school and see if there's a possibility that the school or if, if it's a, a series of schools um, can buy the books. My advice personally would be. Um, please don't illegally download material because it's it belongs to those people. They've produced it. They've they generate their income comes from that. Um, and think about it: if it was your material and your um, work that someone else was taking illegally and depriving you of income, so please don't try and find books illegally. That's that's just what I wanted to say on that. <laughs> um, I could just add to that though. I think. You know, the generosity of, of um, picture book creators and publishers during the pandemic and the, the video read alouds that Tasha and Gayla um, shared on uh, mm. Monday are such yeah. a gift to the, yeah. to the primary LT community. So if access is challenging for you to get picture books particularly, I think that's a mm. great start. Um, for bringing those those uh, stories and those characters into your lesson mm -hmm. and you have yeah. the lesson plans as well <laughs> yeah not exactly exactly um okay i think we're gonna have to stop there i just want to mention um that obviously david uh, your webinar is the second in the series of three that we have uh running this week um, as, as we said, uh, we had Gail Ellis and Tasha Grimbaum on Monday um, talking about using pitch book video read alouds. And that recording is available on Teach English. On Friday, um, we have Laura McWilliams, who's going to be talking um, more windows, a window to the world, and graphic novels in the secondary English language classroom. So if you're teaching secondary students, then, um, then come along to that. And um, that's pretty much it. I just want to say thanks again, David. Really, really fascinating, really enjoyable. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. And thank you, everyone, for coming. Okay, and thank you. And hopefully we'll see you on Friday, either in Zoom or on Facebook. Um, so great. Enjoy the rest of the week. And thanks again, David. See you again soon. Thank hopefully. you. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye.